happens to them in one form or another. Um, in case you don't know who we are, EIA is an independent campaigning organisation. We're based in London. We're also based in Washington, D.C. We're established in 1984. And we have a sort of trademark um, investigative journalist style investigations where we document and expose environmental crime. Um, our office in London works primarily in Africa and Asia on a range of campaigns. What's environmental crime? Well, I'm sure some of you, or most of you, are familiar with this. Um, the UNODC recognises it as serious transnational organised crime. Interpol called it a serious and growing international problem, one which takes many different forms. And UNEP, in a report that came out just a few weeks ago, says that it's driven by perception of low risk and high profit, which has involved or is attracting the greater interest of organised crime groups. Why should we care about environmental crime? <coughs> it undermines communities, um, as we were talking about earlier, it causes conflict, it also undermines national security. It robs countries of their natural resources and empowers criminals, essentially. It destroys biodiversity. It doesn't really matter what species, big or small. Um, they're all targeted throughout the ecosystem. It's not treated as a priority crime generally. It symbolises market confusion between legal, legal and illegal products in some cases. Um, for example, ivory. Um, this is a photograph taken in a town called Linksha, Gansu province of China where illegal ivory is openly for sale in the presence of a police vehicle and um, it's a persistent trading hub for all kinds of wildlife items. Environmental crime is a threat to our future. This is a report that EIA published in 2008 and it was our first cross campaigns report. We have different campaigns, so we have say a, an elephants campaign, we have an Asian big cats campaign, forest campaign, cetaceans campaign, global environment campaign and so on. But this was our first overarching report where we looked at environmental crime as a kind of more holistic issue and also recommendations about the cross-cutting issues that, that you find time and time again, things that perpetuate environmental crime, for example, corruption. How do we work? We investigate and document. Um, we start off with often desk-based research, but then we go out and we ground truth and we basically gain evidence of what's going on and then we'll put together a report, often accompanied by film, and we'll just put that out there and give it to the international decision makers to try and effect change. Um, we support national and international enforcement agencies in different ways, and we also work with partners in country, and that can either be in an informal way or kind of more formal partnerships that <coughs> can go on for many, many years. Role of NGOs in environmental crime. We conduct our own investigations. We have different powers, obviously, and remit from enforcement agencies. In some countries, <coughs> NGOs work very, very closely with enforcement agencies, especially countries with a weaker rule of law than, say, in the UK, or where there's significant capacity issues. Um, EI doesn't do that. When I say we support enforcement agencies, it's more about things like campaigning for sustainably funded, um, either international, intergovernmental, or national enforcement agencies. We don't do joint investigations with enforcement agencies in country or otherwise. Um, NGOs can also help by supporting and bringing together a range of different organisations, and I'll give an example in the film um, of that. We can be outspoken um, a lot of the time because we're not based in the countries that we work in. We have partners there, but we're, we're not, we're, we're allowed to be fairly independent. We can kind of say what we want. Um, so we can be outspoken and campaign for things like greater transparency and try to generate political will in a variety of different ways and different campaigning styles. And we can also work to enhance public awareness of the issue on different levels, again, nationally, internationally. Uh, I'm going to show you a film called Road to Reform. Um, although I'm meant to be speaking, well, I'm going to speak about wildlife trade. Road to Reform is actually about um, illegal logging, and um, the presentation before was talking about illegal logging in Indonesia. Um, I want to show it because it, it highlights some of the 
real the way that governance issues are intertwined with all sorts of environmental crimes, including illegal logging, um, and sort of how destructive uh, this kind of illegal activity can be, how united action can help. And in this case, um, there's something called a voluntary partnership agreement, which is a bilateral agreement between a producer country, a country that produces timber, and the EU, which is the consuming market. And in this case, it was Indonesia. And in order for this uh, voluntary partnership or VPA process to be undertaken, everybody had to get around the table, and that was all stakeholders, that's people from forest businesses, basically you know, private sector, civil society, NGOs, academics, all sorts of people, and they had to sit down and essentially define at first what is legal timber, you know, and that took a couple of years, and then how are we going to put a system in place that guarantees that there can be legally sourced timber from Indonesia, traded with the EU, and so on. Um, so I think the audience here today is something that how academics particularly can also be involved in decision-making processes around making things more transparent, around making things, um, around discussions about legality, um, moving things forward essentially. I um, spoke to a colleague who worked directly on this Indonesia VPA process um, around the legality of short timber and she said getting academics involved meant that they could bring a fresh perspective into negotiations. As you can imagine the tensions could run quite high during those meetings because you had business on one side essentially as civil society and it could get very very fraught. But academics helped to mediate things. So getting everyone together and talking about issues in the context of say illegal logging and, and instituting a process like this is really, really valuable. So I'll just put the film on. Tim mentioned Telepac, um, EIA and Telepac worked very closely for a long time um, in Indonesia and so this is a joint EIA Telepac film about illegal logging and the voluntary partnership process that took place. Um, and the civil society perspective, because Indonesian civil society largely drove this process. sewaktu terjadi uh, pergantian rezim um, yaitu sesudah suatu turun dan waktunya sangat tepat waktu itu karena kita punya pemerintahan baru yang punya itikat untuk memperbaiki pemerintahan yang sebelumnya gitu kan pada saat yang sama juga uh, ada ruang sebetulnya bagi masyarakat sipil untuk ikut uh, terlibat gitu jadi ada kebebasan lebih luas bagi media bagi uh, kelompok masyarakat sipil untuk bergerak di lapangan mengumpulkan informasi um, and we held a press conference and we named names and we used our undercover um, footage which is a methodology that EIA uses to actually prove conversations had taken place and to show the extent to which the illegal logging and the illegal trade um, was occurring in this area and it kind of forced the government to the table because the media loved it and um, it was very risky, it was an extremely dangerous thing to do 
but it's something that really worked and it did bring the government to open the door and say oh my gosh it's Telepac and EIA yes we'll talk with you now and you know not everybody is bad in a government not everybody's involved in illegal lobbying and so for those who wanted to see change happen in the forestry department there was an opportunity for them to, 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 to do something and work with people who they might be able to challenge the corruption that was going on at the time kita melakukan penguatan kapasitas kepada masyarakat sipil kelompok-kelompok masyarakat sipil itu melalui um, berbagai pelatihan untuk mendokumentasikan bukti-bukti um, kejahatan hutan dan bagaimana mengemas informasi yang didapat dari lapangan menjadi um, sebuah uh, informasi yang bisa digunakan untuk mempengaruhi uh, pengambil kebijakan, penegak hukum untuk bertindak terhadap um, kejahatan ilegal logging ini. Pada dasarnya Presiden, sesuai dengan kebijakannya untuk melawan illegal logging ini, sudah memerintahkan kepada Kapolri, dibantu oleh Menteri Dalam Negeri, Menteri Kehutanan, Imigrasi, dan dari TNI, agar supaya dilakukan operasi terpadu yang menindak semua pihak-pihak yang terkait, yang terlibat. Sasaran-sasaran operasi ke depan ini juga harus mampu menyentuh dan menangkap para cukong-cukong. Pertama, selain kita lakukan law enforcement dengan cara represif, itu membuat efek jerah. Our government, Indonesia government, can cannot work alone. We need support from other country like Europe. This is the way to change mind, to stop illegal logging and make our forest sustainable. I think Indonesia has been a prime mover in flake tea. Uh, it led the way in the Bali conference in, in raising the international issue. Uh, the declaration that uh, Indonesia led on uh, was then followed by uh, various agreements with consuming countries, countries like UK and Europe, a part of the problem of illegal logging, because we're buying the timber. We're buying illegal timber. Negara ini lebih bagus dalam pengolah hutan, ada governance itu. Jadi kalau enggak illegal logging pasti akan membinasakan kita, ya kan? Aparatnya jadi enggak berwibawa, rakyatnya juga hanya hit and run, ya habis hutan kita. Sudah melewati proses yang cukup panjang bertahun-tahun, akhirnya pada awal Januari 2007 kami berhasil menyelesaikan standar verifikasi legalitas kayu yang disepakati oleh seluruh stakeholder yang terlibat, masyarakat sipil, pemerintah, akademisi, masyarakat adat, ya kan? kemudian industri juga. Dan ini merupakan satu prestasi besar karena ketika kami memulai proses ini, Hampir tidak ada orang yang percaya bahwa Indonesia bisa menyelesaikan tugas menyusun standar verifikasi legalitas kayu. Mungkin yang lebih baik adalah preventif kita meningkatkan sertifikat legalitas. Karena dengan represif tetap saja, faktanya yang terima si negara-negara konsumen yang menerima juga. Karena kayu murah tentu orang lebih suka kan. Di sini juga sama saja, karena liga pernahnya lepas, waktu terus saja tempat. Lalu kita berpikir, kalau gitu ini persoalan yang gak dua juga nih, antara kita konsumen sama produsennya. Lalu kita coba call, 
melalui bagaimana kalau di sana juga diatur. Maka lahirlah inisiatif VP ini. We are all here to continue the discussion and negotiation departing to a voluntary partnership agreements on policy law enforcement, governance, governance and trade. We are here responding to the government's call to try to combat illegal logging. And what that it was meant with the BPA, it can be done with much easier and more straightforward. The President of your country, the President of the European Commission, and the Presidency of the European Union, they are strong, the strongest global allies in these areas of forestry management, environmental issues, climate change. So there's a great political commitment underpinning the negotiations on both sides. Some stakeholders have said this trade with Europe is not important. The timber trade in Europe is not important for uh, Indonesia's forest industry. Uh, and I would refute that by looking at the forest statistics. Uh, and I can tell you that those statistics say that the value of timber exports, forest exports, to Europe is over a billion US dollars per year. Europe likes Indonesian products, but they don't like them if they're illegal. Ini semua materialnya berasal dari Certified Community Forest. Certified Community Forest yang berlokasi di Gunung Kidul. Pasar Eropa bagi Jawa Puri Lestari sangat penting karena portfolio dari ekspor Jawa Puri Lestari hampir 60% itu ke Eropa. Harapan saya terhadap VPA kalau itu memang benar-benar bisa dilaksanakan dan di sisi Indonesia, di sisi produsernya dikontrol dan ketat itu adalah rekognisi bahwa Indonesia sebagai negara yang, yang menggunakan bahan baku yang legal itu semakin naik akibatnya demand atau pasar itu juga semakin percaya kepada Indonesia itu saja yang ingin saya harapkan dari kita Salah satu permintaan atau tuntutan Indonesia kepada EU adalah supaya di EU ada juga legislasi yang akan melarang beredarnya kayu-kayu yang berasal dari sumber ilegal di EU atau di Uni Eropa ya karena uh, kita punya problem dengan negara-negara ketiga seperti Malaysia dan Cina yang mengolah kayu dari Indonesia dan mengekspornya ke EU jadi kalau EU ingin Indonesia cuma memproduksi kayu legal EU juga harus cuma menerima kayu legal You have to have an offense in Indonesia where the courts are safe. The European Union is, is very concerned about Indonesia's forest because rates of deforestation are so high and now the climate change agenda is, has really shown Illegal logging and the trade in illegal timber is, is a part of that, but there's much more that we have to do on top of that. Um, we have to do something about the peatlands, um, why peatlands are being uh, turned over to plantations, drained with all the CO2 that's coming off. Um, and on top of that, the conversion of, of natural forest to oil palm. Saat ini, 
masyarakat adat itu juga mengalami satu dampak yang begitu besar bagi mereka tentang perubahan iklim yang akibat dari satu proses pembangunan yang panjang itu sendiri. Salah satu isu utama RDD itu balik lagi ke tata kelola. Jadi kalau misalnya Indonesia tidak bisa atau pemerintah tidak punya governance yang baik, itu tidak mungkin bisa melaksanakan RDD. Dan kaitannya dengan um, SPLK saat ini sebetulnya kalau saya pribadi uh, inginnya inisiatif um, RDD yang ada di Indonesia mestinya juga bisa melewati proses yang sama seperti inisiatif menyusun SPLK. Jadi artinya banyak konsultasi, itu kan ada proses yang melibatkan semua pihak, masyarakat, terutama masyarakat, masyarakat adat dan masyarakat lokal. EIA want from COP16? We want countries to stop stimulating demand. And again, I'll show you um, another short film which will explain the issues in quite a concise way. Um, our ambitions for this meeting. internet connection got the right hand side it's connected I think that just means it's an insecurity I'll show you
elephants are being killed every year for their ivory, and two one-off sales of stockpiled ivory endorsed by CITES have done nothing to stop the flow of illegal ivory onto the marketplaces in Asia, particularly Thailand and China, where up to 90% of the ivory available on the marketplace is said to come from illegal sources. The priority for CITES must be to close down ivory markets, both legal and illegal, and to tackle the policies that currently stimulate demand in ivory products. The parties to CITES also need to tackle the criminal networks that are involved. national legislative measures, trafficking of Thailand rosewood across the borders of several countries in the region and ultimately into markets in China poses a serious threat to the viability of the species as well as the security of the region, with vulnerable communities caught in the crossfire during clashes between illegal logging gangs and the Thai military. The priority for CITES must be to support the proposal from Thailand and Vietnam to list Thai rosewood on Appendix 2 of CITES to allow for more rigorous monitoring of regulated trade. a market for luxury skin rugs and their bones are used to make medicines and tonics. The CITES listing of tigers and other Asian red cats is being undermined by a lack of effective enforcement. Sure there's lots of seizures being made but no one's being convicted. No one's being held accountable for this massive illegal trade and the parties that are affected by this trade are failing to report proactively on what steps they're taking to make enforcement more effective, and that's just not acceptable. The CITES listing is also undermined by the fact there are countries that allow the breeding of tigers for their parts and products, and trade in these farmed parts and products is, is perpetuating demand, and that is stimulating poaching. And the countries that are most guilty of that are China, Thailand, Vietnam, and Laos. The conference of the parties to CITES has to get tougher and get tougher quicker. What we need is an independent body to go out there and review implementation of the resolutions and the decisions that relate to tigers and other Asian big cats. And the parties to CITES must be prepared to call for trade suspensions against those that are found to be in non-compliance, defying the letter and spirit of the CITES resolutions. Prey phase one, which took place in India, um, and Nepal, I 
think, Prey Phase 2, which was in other Southeast Asian countries. So Tiger gets a lot of attention, um, but still, there's, uh, as you can see, not many left in the wild. Tiger's a good thing to talk about in terms of the value, uh, which was, again, one of the themes of, of this seminar. What I've, I'll give some examples in a minute about the instrumental value of wildlife to many people, and including tiger traders. But then I think you know a lot of people also have a, an intri a sort of understanding of an intrinsic value of wildlife. A tiger's good because it sits at the top of the food chain. So if you protect a tiger, then you're protecting everything below it. And if you have tiger in your forest, then you know that the forest is basically a healthy forest in terms of <coughs> the prey base that has to exist for the tiger to exist in the first place. Um, so it's a symbol of good governance, so this is one of the reasons why it's attracted this, this kind of attention from intergovernmental organisations like Interpol. On the other hand, there's people who are basically banking on the, on the extinction of the tiger because they are farming tigers. So you have a very small, comparatively wild population of tigers and a much larger population of captive bred tigers. In in the year of the tiger, which was 2010, traders that our investigations engaged said that everybody will want a tiger skin in the year of the tiger. But there again, tigers are quite rare, so traders are saying that tiger skins are hard and harder and harder to get hold of. But instead you can get leopard skins and snow leopard skins, so it kind of means that we shouldn't just concentrate on tigers, we should concentrate on all Asian big cats. And indeed, that's what the society's resolution is about. It's about all Asian big cats. They all face the same threats. And there's also problems around enforcing laws, generally not just to do with tigers, but you need a law to enforce in the first place. So in terms of uh, where you know certain NGOs might talk about the intrinsic value of tigers, other NGOs might simply just stick to the message, there is a law, therefore enforce it. But in some countries, it's not even illegal to poach. So what can you really do with that? How, how can you kind of even start to tackle some of these issues if the law isn't there in the first place? So based on our records and those of uh, Wildlife Protection Society of India, there's over 5,400 Asian big cats um, have been identified, and by that I mean seized, in illegal trade since the year 2000. And this includes nearly 300 Asian big cats, which are captive bred, mostly being tigers. So in 2006, on the Tibetan Plateau, EIA and Wildlife Protection Society of India documented massive scale of using the skins of endangered big cats to decorate traditional costumes amongst the Tibetan community. And we wrote a report on this called Skinning the Cat, um, which was preceded by a report called the Tiger Skin Trail that looked at organised crime links of how these big cats are sourced in India and Nepal and how it goes into Tibet and so on. Um, and basically, what happened after this big expose was the Tibetan market collapsed. Essentially, that community stopped using the skins of endangered species. However, the trade didn't go away. It just went underground in the end. A new market emerged, and the key players, the people behind the trade, not the consumers, but the people, the criminals, the people that are controlling the trade, continued to operate because they were enabled to do so, essentially. So these are pictures from later investigations, so from 2007 onwards. This is a snow leopard in Lingxia, Gansu province of China, a town that we visited every year since uh, 2005 um, to document the changes in the market, changes in trends in demand for Asian big cat skins and bones. And this is a tiger skin. Um, you can see the way the head is filled out. This is actually prepared for taxidermy and home decor purposes, basically making a tiger skin rope, which is considered to be a luxury item. It's not for traditional costumes. As I said, the market has changed. The traders, since 2006 and the Tibetan market collapsed, the traders started talking about how it was actually now mainland Chinese, so Han Chinese, buying these products. And um, it was for luxury home decor, and it was people who were in the military. It was people who were high-ranking government officials. So this is a completely different market. 
but it just shows in the absence of directives and effective enforcement, the market may change, but it still remains in one form. Did an investigation in 2012, and we still continue to find these endangered big cat skins for sale. Why is it happening? Well, we ended up again meeting the same trader that we've been engaging since 2006. And he said, imprisonment is impossible. When they can't confiscate the items, we'll just find the people inside, pay a bit of money, and retrieve the items. So this is a guy who is, uh, we'd say he's a persistent trader. He's actually even aware that he's a subject, he was the subject of a media expose, that he's internationally famous because he appeared in the film yesterday. Um, but he's got no problem with, no fear of local enforcement. He's able to continue what he's doing. And indeed, he's sort of talking about, even if he did get his big cat skins confiscated, he could just pay someone off and go get them back. And, you know, no fear of any kind of reprisal there. So seizures are not effective enforcement, especially in the wildlife trade. And that's because um, if you have an animal poached and then those products are seized, all that's going to happen is that more animals will die to fulfil that order. Okay, so it is quite different um, to other trades in that sense. Um, what is effective enforcement are things like using more sophisticated investigation methods like controlled deliveries, and it's not without precedent. I know Bel Belgian Customs has been working with ivory consignments, with Hong Kong Customs doing controlled deliveries there. But generally, these kind of things are only happening for very small amounts of ivory. As far as I know, there haven't been controlled deliveries of large, you know, significant amounts of ivory, which indicates, a, you know, directly indicates an organised crime involvement. Um, there was a kind of controlled delivery between Indonesia and Vietnam um, in 2012 for five tons of pangolin, uh, because there was a special operation for pangolin trade. So there is a precedent. Therefore, it's just that these methods aren't universally applied or um, the right skills aren't in place in country and so on. We also talk about how there's a need for targeted intelligence driven operations and you know enforcement agencies need to develop actionable intelligence either through you know a network of informants or through investigations including covert investigations and there also needs to be some kind of post -oper operational analysis that goes on so that you don't just keep making the same mistakes again and again. And what we, the current situation is that parties stand up at these big international meetings like ASITES and, you know, in China, the Chinese government will say, trade in Asian big cat skins has been effectively deterred in the trading hubs that we visit every year. So we know that's not true. But there's no measurement of how this deterrence has taken place. There's no measure given of, of how, what operations have taken place and how effective they've been. And also, to tackle wildlife trade, trade in any kind of environmental crime, you need to tackle corruption because it actually affects and facilitates every single stage of the chain. And people need to be honest about, you know, you can't, you actually can't tackle this crime type without looking at issues like corruption. This is a report we published in 2010. It was called Enforcement Not Extinction, and it. It's using tie the tiger and tiger trade and Asian big cat trade as a kind of, you know, overarching look at what's wrong with with enforcement, um, and you know those recommendations can kind of be applied across different types of endangered species. So we recommend a greater involvement of police and customs in big cat conservation, reduce demand for big cat parks, expand the use of intelligence and enforcement. Improve international cooperation with the aim of disrupting transnational criminal networks. Continue with judicial reform. Increase resources to combat all environmental crime. Improve the motivation and enforcement officers and tackle corruption and improve transparency. So, not at all order. <laughs> Legal or illegal <coughs> trade. This is our new report. It's coming out next week. I wish I could talk about it more. Um, but I can only really give you the headlines. Um, it's called Hidden in Plain Sight, and it's called China's Clandestine Tiger Trade. Going back to when something's illegal, but then there is a parallel legal market, can cause confusion, I would say, directly undermines conservation. 
In China, there's over 5,000 tigers in captivity. China has tiger farms. There's over 200 facilities with tigers in. Um, some, there's two really, really big ones that have over 1,000 tigers. And this has been growing since the late 80s under uh, favorable policies. The wild tiger population in China is about 40 to 50 tigers. This is tiger farm in China. There's also more captive tigers in countries like Thailand, Laos, Vietnam. Um, there's rumours about tiger farms in other countries as well, like uh, Malaysia and Cambodia. The ones with the most tigers, I think, out of this list is Thailand and Laos. And certainly the most problematic is Laos and Thailand. There's tiger farm in uh, Thailand. The international community has rejected tiger farming as a conservation solution. And as parties to CITES, all of these countries have basically, they have a, a duty to implement domestic trade prohibitions, consolidation and destruction of stockpiles of tiger parts and products. They have to ensure that these tiger parts and derivatives from captive tigers don't enter illegal trade. And they also have to ensure that tigers aren't bred for trade in their parts and derivatives. And that's to do with compliance with CITES, basically, in domestic implementation and compliance with CITES. So in 1993, in China, the State Council order had a ban on the use of tiger bone for medicinal purposes. In 2012, in China, EIA has found that regulatory systems have been introduced to allow the commercial sale of skins of captive bred tigers prepared as luxury skin rugs for home decor. So there is a legal domestic trade in China of the skins of captive bred tigers. And it's exactly the same market as the illegal trade in skins from wild Asian big cats, which is for home decor as well. This was a company we visited and um, found a, a, a tiger skin rug and it comes with this permit. Um, talking to the trader, he, he basically described the process um, you take a photo of the tiger skin, you send the photo to the State Forestry Administration who issue a permit like this with a very small photograph so you can't actually tell if that photo refers to that skin. So there's a loophole there that's basically ready to be exploited. And indeed, in this case, our investigators didn't think that there was really much chance that that photo there matched the skin that they were looking at. The owner of one company that we met said that he didn't buy wild skins himself, but he had processed skins from the wild from India on behalf of a high-ranking governor friend of his. Um, we don't actually know about the scale of this trade. Basically what's existing here is a legal domestic trade system into which illegally acquired skins from India and Nepal can be laundered. And we've asked the State Forestry Administration of China on many occasions to uh, talk about how many permits have been issued, how many people are processing these skins, and they have not been transparent. Uh, we identified 200 companies um, that had licenses to keep tigers, and a more than 100 that were registered under a special marking system that enables this to take place. So we're asking the State Forestry Administration to provide clarity as to how many skins have been sold from cap captive sources, how many permits have been processed, and how many have been processed, and how do they know that skins of wild tigers and leopards aren't entering this trade? Despite the ban in uh, 1993 from the State Council on the use of tiger bone in medicine, tiger bones have not been destroyed, they've been stockpiled. I mentioned all those facilities with captive bred tigers in China. There have been multiple exposés by, both by EIA and other organisations and you know, media. Um, there's also been a sales of tiger bone wine, which is, an, is basically, it's not a medicine, it's a tonic, and it's, it's made by soaking tiger bones in a kind of a tonic mixture, and people will drink it for reasons of health. Um, and there's been lots of suggestive marketing. Under the State Council ban um, from 1993, you're not allowed to say tiger bone is being used in a product. Um, but there's ways that people who are far farming tigers and have wineries attached to their tiger farms um, and are selling wine 
are suggesting that the wine they're selling, even though legally they might not be able to say it's tigers, they're kind of suggesting in certain ways that it is. For example, by selling in the tiger-shaped bottle. Um, or, you know, basically the staff at these, this is 2000 and the next one's 2006 and seven period, the staff at these places tell our investigators, yeah, you know, it's tigers, but we're not allowed to tell, you know, to officials there. Or they'll pass it off as lion bone, you know, but, you know, how, how this can be verified is not been spoken about. Again, a tiger-shaped bottle with this kind of tiger bone wine. In 2012, in China, despite this state council ban, um, EIA has found that tonics made by soaking tiger bone in wine are being produced for marketing. And more than that, traders have been referencing a secret government notification issued in 2005 that allows them to do this legally, apparently. We identified a company using the method to produce something called real tiger wine. Real tiger wine does not list tiger bone as an ingredient, but the process involved return the bones to the tiger bone stockpile to be available for audit and inspection, having made the wine. So basically, China's government policy has encouraged growth and expansion of operations, both licensed to both keep and breed tigers. And trade is happening from these facilities. It runs directly in opposition to demand reduction initiatives, which um, you know many, many different stakeholders are involved with across China and elsewhere. And it undermines both domestic implementation of CITES and the international conservation programs, such as Global Tiger Initiative. So this is what we're talking about when we're saying stop stimulating demand. Internationally, China is a signatory to societies, but domestically, policies are in place that are stimulating demand, which is undermining conservation of wild tigers and other regional pets. So, in our report, we're recommending that the National People's Congress can ensure domestic compliance of societies by amending the law, essentially, um, to end all trade in all parts and products from tigers and other ancient big cats from all sources, to consolidate and destroy stockpiles, and to send a clear message to tiger breeders and industry to end trade. There's a lot of different policies that have happened, a lot of confusion, and I think that basically these tiger farmers have kind of had the perception that let's just go ahead and do it and, you know. Stockpiles are an issue. Another you know, types of species. This is an uh, ivory stockpile in Tanzania. 1989, there was an international ban for ivory trade. 1999, there was a one off sale uh, from African countries to Japan. China 2000, traders said to EIA, We've been longing for the opportunity to sell our ivory as well. If this relaxation continues, the ivory market, especially for ivory craft items like, like what we have, will bloom. It's almost impossible that our ivory products will be stagnated in the market. So traders in China, whose business had been affected by this international ban in ivory, um, saw the one-off sell from African countries to Japan and were hoping for the same opportunity themselves. Um, there was a massive seizure of ivory in Singapore in 2002, um, where I think it was over six tons of tusks were seized and then a further over one ton of um, hankos, which are name, sort of name seals um, made out of ivory were seized. Um, very famous seizure. Um, investigations found that there had been 19 similar shipments in massive amounts of ivory um, going from Africa into Asia. Um, and so far, even though it's in 2002, the network has escaped not only identification and Execution. So again, the key players were not taken out of action. In 2002, after around the time of that seizure, China reported to societies that many Chinese people misunderstood the international decision to sell ivory to Japan and believed that actually trade in ivory had been resumed. There was a second one-off sale to, of ivory to Japan and China approved. And that was in 2002, but the actual sale, it didn't, the ivory didn't go anywhere until 2008, which kept the issue on the table in the international arena of societies. Meanwhile, our investigations talking to traders in China and Hong Kong, they started talking more about how they hide their illegal stock from inspectors and how 
illegal ivory trade continued to flow into the country. But they also started talking about how their domestic market was growing. And they assured EIA investigators that domestic ivory sale of ivory is very good, ivory sells very well. What was the market for this? Um, they said that ivory products were demanded as presents or gifts for high-ranking government officials, especially if it's to win a promotion of work. So essentially non-financial bribes. Large seizure in Hong Kong. Talking to traders directly as our investigations do is kind of a good litmus test of, of what the trends in the market are and um, trafficking MOs and things like that. Um, I was looking back over the transcript survivor investigations from 2000 to 2010 and basically a picture of unevenly applied enforcement emerged. I wouldn't say it was non-existent at all, but unevenly applied enforcement certainly. One of the traders said when it comes to smuggling, traffickers get notices. Some of them are very close to the people in customs. So if the stuff has been seized, they basically buy it back from customs. The customs don't really earn much, so what do they want? If I was a customs officer and you passed by in my area and I detained your goods, I'd sell it off. It would be my personal gain. So I own a bit and you earn a bit as well. Meanwhile, this is um, trade in work ivory products. Referencing the 2002 ivory sale, which went through in 2008, um, an ivory trader in Hong Kong said, 70 tons of ivory will all be used in mainland China. Mainland China. It's a very small amount. They won't carve this kind of stuff with their 70 tons. In one year, it'll all be gone. There's so many people. Even if they kill all the African elephants, it won't be enough to make chopsticks. So what the trader was saying essentially is that these one-off sales that happen, no way could satisfy demand. EIA asked traders how much of the raw material available in the market is legal, as in from the CITES sanctioned sale, and the trader said not even 10%. Zambia and Tanzania, 2010, we went to the source. Traders told us we've got a quarter to nearly half a tonne available at the moment, and we can organise between a tonne and two tonnes in a month. So, quite a lot of supply. This guy Big guy. He talked about how, yeah, he'd been inside before, but he came out at the end of the day, he just had to pay his way out of prison. Um, this is a graph of seized ivory in tons and number of elephants killed. Um, it only goes halfway up to June 2012, but you can see a general upward trend in both poaching and seizures of ivory. And record seizures have taken place over the past three years. So EIA's recommendations um, would be to close down all ivory markets, legal and illegal, because at the moment, again, you've got two parallel markets. You've got a legal CITES sanctioned market um, with loopholes, and then in China and Japan, and then you've got your illegal market into which, you know, there can be laundering from the illegal market into the legal market, as traders have told us. Amend domestic policies that stimulate demand for ivory products and tackle the criminals behind the illegal ivory trade. However, on the CITES agenda is something called a decision making for process of future trade in ivory, which basically means um, discussing how we can have a future ivory trade, even though poaching and, and ivory trafficking is at record levels. So given that this might go ahead, EIA um, has recommended that there is an independent review of what we call the elephant crisis and look at the fundamental reasons for the failure of ivory trade regulation system. Look at domestic compliance with CITES requirements. Look at criminal justice gaps and needs at all points in the trade chain from field to market, including the International Consortium on Combating Wildlife Crime uh, Analytic, uh, Wildlife and Forest Crime Analytic Toolkit, which can do just that. And look at corruption and criminality factors and rising demand and how that actually impacts on the illegal ivory trade. So basically, before we start talking about a legal ivory trade all over again, why don't we look at what's wrong with enforcement of the illegal ivory trade and try and fix that first. And when you know those problems have basically don't exist anymore, then we've um, been looking at a way our investigations engage 
uh, illegal traders or offenders essentially and I think there's some value again something that maybe academics would be interested in some value in in what they're saying um, and it can be used to a range of different purposes and um, I think you know a lot of when our investigations happen there on the ground we kind of we know what's going on we know what the trends are we know where things are coming from because traders are telling us and they're kind of an unexploited source of information at the moment um, you don't get investigations generally like that from enforcement agencies because as I was saying that kind of effective enforcement um, where there's sort of in-depth operations or uh, sort of intelligence-led operations isn't really going on at least not in a consistent way so if there was some way of capturing that for a variety of different stakeholders, then it would help resource tasking and resource analysis. I was talking to someone who um, initiated a problem-solving operation in metal theft in Durham, and the feedback from the offenders there, who were you know, habitual metal thieves, after this, this problem-solving operation, basically, like, we're not going to bother anymore. It's too much hassle, you know, because that operation was very well designed and it actually impacted and it disrupted them and it led to a reduction in crime. So if you get feedback like that from offenders, then that's a good indication that the methods that you used have actually worked. Talking about like, using that kind of information, I think especially um, good for things like crime scripts, where you list a series of actions, what happens in the commission of a crime, and what the intervention points are which can help in crime prevention, policy development and engaging a whole range of people with an interest in reducing crime. You can look at the impact of legal sales or a legal market on illegal markets and the interplay between those and vice versa. And they can help identify needs for change or raise corruption issues um, and help to improve transparency. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Almost finished. Um, so yeah, just to sum up what's needed, um, I think you basically um, said all of this already. I think overall a recognition of the urgency of the threat of environmental crime, stop stimulating demand through contradictory policies, demonstrate effective enforcement, tackle corruption, make the criminal justice system more robust, enhance community rights, involve community in decision making, Enforcement agencies need to communicate and collaborate, share information, and also political commitment overall because it has to be, it has to come from that. That's the end. I've got some reports, not very many, but basically we did a one called Appetite for Destruction about China's timber trade. Um, China is a processor of the world's timber. There's an e-waste report called System Failure and the aforesaid enforcement not extinction report on the big cap enforcement as well. So thank you very much.